hello and welcome to relaxation hypnosis for stress, anxiety and panic attacks. My name is Jason Newland. Please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes. Now, what I thought I'd do today is an exercise. Now, that means sit ups. Trust me, if you saw me, you'd know that I didn't mean sit ups. Well, I do have a sit up bench, which is very, very handy for putting clothes on. Very good at collecting dust. So, I was thinking about the way that maybe some of us are able to hold on to anxiety. Because you know, a lot of anxiety it can be due to something that's happened in the past. I think the biggest most extreme example was a client I had when I was a counsellor. And there was this big thing that happened in the town. Uh, and it was a uh, I won't go into details, but it was, it was uh, basically something that happened in the town. People saw it. And this, this young lady, she was a witness to what she saw. And it involved a vehicle and a, a, her friend was on the pavement. And it was just horrible. But I saw her probably a year after the event. And... She didn't feel safe to walk on the pavement. She didn't feel safe leaving her house because she expected a car to come onto the pavement and knock her over like it did her friend. So, I could have spent six weeks talking to her. I could have spent six weeks listening to her. Which I was prepared to do. That was my job when I was a counsellor. However, the level of uh, anxiety that she had, I felt it was only, it seemed immoral to not help her to reduce that anxiety if I knew how to seems kind of wrong to have not to not do that if you know how to help someone and you don't it kind of seems a bit I don't know a bit wrong especially in a situation like this so I didn't do hypnosis with her exactly I did some visualization. I did some, uh, I, I say played with the memory, but I, that's kind of what we did. We had the memory, and I got her to think back to the memory, but in different ways. And it's a version of the quick quick phobia cure or the five minute phobia cure or whatever in NLP which comes from hypnosis so the idea of not reliving because that would be the cause of the anxiety the reliving it 
that's the cause of the anxiety. But to think about that situation from a different angle. Looking through a window from the distance, from a coffee shop. watching it through binoculars seeing it from the top of a bus just seeing it so you're not reliving it you're not back inside your own body experiencing those feelings that you had at the time because that would be creating anxiety which is the opposite to what any of us want. So what I was thinking is we can play around with this today. And when I say play around, I do mean, you know, not take it too seriously. Think of it as a as an exercise, as a something you can kind of train your brain in a way. And it's always useful to start out with something that isn't particularly too serious at the beginning. So I would advise whenever you learn a new technique, maybe don't use it with the thing that is most traumatic for you. Maybe you know, ease yourself into it. Start off with maybe something that's happened recently uh, with somebody, maybe somebody said something in it wasn't pleasant you didn't enjoy the experience or maybe whatever it was but it wasn't it's not the end of the world but it wasn't nice you know it was uncomfortable and when you think about it it still feels uncomfortable And it'd be nice to be able to think about it and not necessarily feel wonderful about it, you know, because that would, might uh, be a bit strange. But you may feel neutral. It's almost like, you know, when you've got a, a, bore, a hot water in a bath and I've done this so many times. Not had baths. I mean, put hot water in a bath. And it's been too hot to get in. So I turned the cold tap on. And I've gone into the kitchen. Did a bit of tap dancing or whatever I do in there. Come back in. Too much cold water's gone in. And now it's too cold. It's not cold, but it's too cool to get in. It's no longer hot or at like bath temperature and no matter how much hot water I pour into it it doesn't seem to make any difference it's as if that cold water has just neutralised any ability for that water to heat up it's a very strange kind of phenomenon yet that's a similar kind of thing with the mind when you add different dimensions to a memory you add different feelings to an emotion and you play around with stuff like that it changes it actually changes the way you feel And it can be quite surprising. And there are unlimited ways 
to get this result. I could make a new recording every day for the rest of my life, giving you different ways to do this. Maybe I'll do that, I don't know. But you can start to come up with your own ways because that creativity that we all have you know that creative mind starts to think ah I wonder it's a little bit I suppose like you learn how to cook you can do an apprenticeship with the greatest chef in the world and you can spend five years training with that chef and you can learn everything the chef's the chef knows your creative mind's gonna think of new stuff and what if I mix some mustard in with that porridge I don't know as an example or not probably a good example And then you come up with something new, something creative. Even though you didn't need to, because you had more knowledge than maybe most chefs. Because you've studied with that, the top chef in the world. That's just an example. And when people say, oh, I'm a perfectionist, not talking about me, but talking about themselves. It might be true in some ways. They can only be consciously. Because unconsciously, they're not perfectionists. Otherwise, they couldn't be creative. Because creativity comes from imperfection comes from thinking about things in a different way, mixing together things that shouldn't be mixed together, fitting things together that don't belong in the same space, that then leads to a completely new invention or creation. But that perfectionist mind wouldn't allow that process to occur. I don't think it'll nip it in the bud straight away. Sweet and sour sauce it sounds illogical. Sweet and sour sauce, no, nope. nip that in the bud when in fact actually it's. it's gorgeous for those that like sweet and sour sauce peanut bar I'm not a big fan very popular in the world and now as a mixture that came about from I suppose a creative thought The perfectionist part of the brain would have gone, no, that can't go together. Butter and peanuts. I wouldn't put peanuts in a, a sandwich. That tastes horrible. Therefore, peanut butter wouldn't be right. So that creative side of your brain actually appreciates and I think it if you give it a bit of a bit of uh, space to rain to roam to grow to play it can have a lot of fun and it can help you in ways that maybe your your conscious mind you know that that thing that maybe is 
serious, a bit a bit too serious sometimes, and um, but at the same time, you know, it's looking out for, for yourself and trying to keep yourself safe and protected, and perhaps isn't maybe a bit too blinkered at times, which can be a great thing in some ways to be able to keep, you know, if you're playing darts, you're playing sports, you know, if you're doing an operation, you kind of, I guess, need to have that blinkered state where you're focusing solely on what you're doing. You know, I like to think that if ever, you know, I have to have an operation or whatever, I like to think that the doctor and a surgeon isn't thinking about what he's or she's going to have for dinner tonight when they're operating on me I like to think that that's what they're thinking about that's what they're focusing on so they're not feeling creative and thinking oh I wonder what his wonder what, it could be like so I wonder what he'd look like if he exercised that's kind of the creative and he started thinking oh he might be muscular perhaps he wouldn't have that big belly so there's a time for that blinkeredness and I think sometimes perhaps we get blinkered at the wrong times for example I would suggest that possibly anxiety, panic can be very much a blinkered state of mind that sole focus on this is what happened before therefore this is what's going to happen again mentality Or with that young lady completely focused on uh, every car that went past while she was on the pavement. And you know what? It's so understandable that someone would feel that way. It's understandable. You know, if you see someone... Uh, I saw my a friend got run over when I was very young and most of my life I've been really careful when I cross the road you know I, I look and I just walk out I know that most people look before they cross but I know people that don't but then I think sometimes people can see over the cars because they're taller than me. So I'm like crossing over and just trying to look behind the car. I'm not three foot tall, but I'm not not tall, tall. So you've got that focus. Then you've got that creativity. They're not exclusive. I mean, you can have both, I guess, in the sense of being focused on being creative someone that's painting can be very focused and incredibly creative at the same time so it's kind of mixing it like the paints I suppose so when you've got that memory for example if you think about something now that happened in the last two days or week something that annoyed you something that uh, you felt anxious about and maybe you're feeling anxious about seeing that person again and when you think about what happened you had that stress levels increase a bit now I'm not trying to get the your stress levels to increase I'm here for the opposite to that and it's just an example as you think about that Imagine 
seeing it from a distance. So you're not actually in the moment, you're not in your body, you're watching yourself with that person, interacting. And you can hear their voice, and maybe it's a sentence they said, a word that they stressed, you know, maybe something they said that's, that upset you. And it's okay to get upset by things, it means you're a human being. Holding on to it and letting it affect your life and your happiness, that's just not acceptable for you. It needs to not be acceptable for you in order for you to move on and be happy. So imagine if you can hear that person saying what they're saying to you. But this time, slow it down. So if they're saying for example, the moon, I don't know, it's sunny outside, but then you hear them go, it is sunny outside. Now I'm guessing that wouldn't be the sentence that had caused or triggered that anxiety response so whatever it was if you just repeat it but in that slow motion voice and just notice how it feels notice how the response that you experience internally is different now to the way it was before when you were just reliving that in your mind. Or maybe you can speed it up so it sounds almost like Mickey Mouse or a squirrel. A squirrel, you know, some kind of car cartoon character. You can make it sound like Daffy Duck, or Donald Duck, or the, the list is endless, it can be anyone, it could be um, one of the Muppets, Kermit, or Miss Piggy. So just have that same sentence, and I'll keep quiet while you do it in your mind, have that same sentence from that person said but in the voice of some funny cartoon character or Muppet or something like that do that now so how did that feel different? So when you think back to that experience you had before with them, you think back to it, how do you feel different now to the way you did before you listened to this recording? When you think back to that interaction you had with that person, notice how it's changed, like, like naturally changed. And got lower. You may even notice that it's like just dropped off completely. It's, like it's the most unimportant thing ever now. It may be difficult to even really believe that it did have an effect before. And now imagine seeing that person. It might be someone you work with, someone that you can't really avoid. But maybe a family member, a loved one. 
a friend, it could be someone you work with, it could be someone that works in a shop, you know, whoever it is. Imagine seeing them again, let's say tomorrow, or, you know, this week, and notice how different you feel about seeing them. If it hasn't gone down to zero, if it hasn't reduced completely that anxiety or stress, you can add one more thing. Imagine seeing them the next time you see them. And imagine when you go up to see them, you notice that they've got a fried egg on top of their head. Just a fried egg with the yolk. It's just laying on top of their head for no reason whatsoever. It's just, it's just there. You could have a boiled egg if you wanted, but you know, say this, let's say a fried egg, and they're talking. And all you can see is that fried egg. Just notice how you feel right now as they're there with that fried egg. And as you blank that out of your mind, just think about a scenario when you're going to see them next, maybe it'll be at work, maybe it'll be in a shop, maybe it'll be a family get together, whatever, like a, a realistic situation where you're actually very likely to see this person. And just imagine going to that place or them coming to you and seeing them. You know, if they knock on your door, you open the door. Or if you go to their house, they open the door. Or maybe you're sitting at your desk at work and they walk in and sit down next to you or at another desk. Might be your boss, might be someone that works for you. Whoever it is, imagine you see them in a real life situation. Imagine in that. Notice how you feel different now to the way you did before. Notice how that stress, anxiety level reduces. Really goes down, sometimes just vanishes completely. Almost like that, the bath with the hot water, too much cold water put in afterwards, neutralizes it neutralizes the hot water to the point where it just can't get hot anymore it's gone it's now at the very best lukewarm which is for me that's an uncomfortable bath that's just you know one step from just being cold Notice how that feels as within your mind this process has been saved. The process has been saved. And those new learnings, those new neural pathworks that are kind of or pathways that are connecting and doing something different to maybe what you've done before. But 
But in some ways, this is perhaps what we already do. You know, distorting a memory. Changing a memory is natural for most people. Unless unless someone's got a photographic memory and they remember everything they've ever heard and that's been said and everything they've read and there's not many of those around most people distort the memory they don't do it purposely it's just there's so much going on in our lives there's so much visual uh, auditory physical stimulation smells, tastes, you know, you name it. Sometimes the memory, it remembers, it gets a little bit muddled up. Perhaps adds a few little bits, misses out a few little bits, distorts. So this is just doing what your brain naturally does, but purposely, in a way to help you, in a way to reduce your stress and your anxiety, reduce those feelings that were not helpful, so that you can feel more relaxed and more able to do more things that will improve your lifestyle. And this is something that you can play around with. Maybe with other situations. And just build it up gradually. And what happens is, it's very likely to happen and I've seen it, is the mind or the brain starts to get used to it and it starts to get, it starts to do it on its own without you needing to do anything. It's kind of like if you've got, if you've got a big table with a thousand legs like it's, I mean, the it's like a slab rather than the table, big, massive concrete slab. Um, if you think about King Arthur and the Round Table, you know something like that. Some big, huge table, but this has got a thousand legs supporting the table. It doesn't need a thousand legs, but the person that built it doesn't realise that. It's just it's so heavy they thought we'll just give it lots and lots of legs to support it. But then it does need a thousand legs in the sense of holding on to these big issues in our brain. And because with it comes to anxiety, stress, panic so many things are connected to each other in our minds so you get one of you get rid of one leg you get one of one t- you know table leg which may have been the thing that we've just discussed in this recording and then you do it with another table leg which could be something that happened last Christmas you know a family dinner someone and you know it could be as simple as you you didn't get the present you didn't get the present you wanted it might sound a bit trivial but for some people that's a that's a big issue so it can be lots of littler things But the more little things, and I say little, I mean compared to the really big stuff. And we've all got big stuff. 
there's all, there's all stuff that maybe we don't want to think about and definitely that's this is not the time to focus on that but the more of those legs they get knocked away what happens eventually the table collapses and the big concrete table the slab of rock or whatever falls down and smashes into many bits so demolished that they can't be put back together again it's not Humpty Dumpty can't be put back together again in fact Humpty Dumpty couldn't be put back together again so it's just like Humpty Dumpty except it's not an egg with legs sitting on a wall about to have a big fall and once that is crumbled it changes everything And that does happen eventually, the more of those smaller legs that get knocked away. Eventually, your mind starts to get used to it, starts to get used to the process, and starts to knock away more of those legs without you even consciously thinking about it. And then eventually, crash. The big stuff that was being big in your mind that's been holding you back that's been maybe uh, what you felt is the cause of the a lot of the anxiety stress and panic just crashes to the floor you could even say that maybe the the big table is the panic attack the big tape your table is the panic and anxiety attacks and the legs are the incidences of the panic attacks. They're the, you know, it's the stressful times, the incidences that's happened. And once they get knocked out, it's gone. It's just like there's, there's cities underwater from thousands of years ago that have been discovered whole cities and nothing is known about them because there are no documents do you think before that happened there could have been a book that told everything about the history of that city chronicling all the events then it got destroyed that's what happens with a table crash, destroyed gives you freedom it's not just the freedom you get at the end it's the freedom you start to feel at the beginning a marathon runner isn't a marathon runner at the end of the marathon they don't just become a marathon runner when they finish the marathon. They're a marathon runner the first day they take that first step in 
training. When they first start training for the marathon, even if they only run around the block once, they are a marathon runner. So I'm going to leave you with that thought. Allow your creative mind to come up with other ideas. And maybe play around with this and see what comes up. So remember to be kind to yourself. Be extra gentle with yourself. Okay? And uh, I will speak to you very soon. Lots of love.